Welcome to the HCI Family of Podcasts, where your source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development. We share our own original research, explore industry trends, and interview executives and thought leaders from across the globe. Join us for practitioner-oriented content around all things leadership, HR, talent management, organizational development, and change management. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with the HCI family of podcasts. Welcome to the podcast. In this podcast episode, I talk with Alex Brookman about his new book, The Strategy Legacy, How to Future-Proof Your Business and Leave Your Mark. Alex Brookman, welcome to the conversation today. Thanks for having me, John. It is a pleasure to be with you again. You were a guest on the podcast maybe a couple of years ago or so. I'm excited to be able to sit down with you again today. We're going to be discussing your new book, which has been having tremendous success, The Strategy Legacy, How to Future-Proof a Business and Leave Your Mark. I love the title. Uh, I love the contents even more. Uh, Before we dive on into the book and really unpack some of that, I just wanted to start with a brief bio for Alex. Alex Brookman is the Wall Street Journal bestselling author of The Strategy Legacy, as I just mentioned. He is the founder and president of Brookman Executive Consulting based in Vancouver. Alex has impacted thousands of leaders across the world. His clients include high growth startups and Fortune 500 executive teams. He holds degrees and certificates in management, leadership and strategy from EBS University, INSEAD and Harvard Business School. And I could say a lot more about you and your background, but I'm going to pause there. Anything else you would like to highlight for the audience before we just dive on into your book? I think you said it wonderfully. (laughs) All right. Well, very good. So why don't you start by just laying the foundation for this book? Why this book? Why now? Uh, What what, uh, gap and what niche are you trying to fill? The book came at the tail end of... And I think I talk about it in the book, in the beginning of the book, well, something that I called a self-induced external shock. Um, my my wife and I, we decided to move from Germany to Canada um, about one and a half years before the pandemic hit, before COVID, um, which means we were about to move continents when it happened. So we moved at the at the end of March 2020, which was the, the first high phase lockdown phase, which was pretty terrible to move continents, but we made it safe and sound. So no complaints on that end. But what happened there was while I was moving closer to my customers in North America, I felt strangely guilty of leaving my customers mm-hmm. in Europe behind. And that guilt kind of was nagging in my head. And a friend of mine said, why don't you hand over a nice present and continue with your life. And (laughs) we we had a hearty laugh about it because, yeah, if it were so simple, you know, everyone would do it. But that idea of a present then developed into why don't I write down what I've been doing with some of these customers and give it to them so that they can replicate it without me. Because, you know, I don't want to fly to Germany for a one-day workshop or things like that. That doesn't make sense. And sometimes when you've gone through something with someone external, you feel I might be able to do this myself the next time if I only had, let's say, a manual for it or something like that. So that was the initial idea. How can I write down what I've been doing with my customers in ways that they can replicate it without me? And that developed into a manuscript that became thicker and thicker and more and more. (laughs) And at some point I was like, yeah, that's not going to work. You can't give people a hundred page PDF document and be like, hey, I know you can do this. So um, I started to start to, to think about what if that might be a book. But at that point in time, I hadn't published any book yet. So I reached out to people in the publishing industry, um, namely my agent, who became then my agent. And I was, I was just asking from a very curious perspective of h- how does all this work? And he, he told me, you know what, send me over the first 50 pages. And two hours later, he, he wrote back like, this is pretty great. Let's do something with that. And then it developed into this book, which is a 
if you want to call it that way, a leadership and strategy manifesto kind of thing. Um, and, 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 and just something that I give the world to enable and empower everyone to make strategy their own thing. I don't believe in, in the concept that strategy is something magical or difficult mm -hmm. or something that happens in a, in a, in a boardroom strategy is for everyone. And every leader needs to understand what strategy is and how it can help them in their in their business in their area of responsibility and that's how the idea of of packaging it into a book about becoming a strategic leader and, and future proving your business uh, came about yeah well i love that being able to share your experiences your wisdom your insights in a practical guide of sorts uh, yeah. for others to be able to replicate i i think that's tremendous and I also like, you know, the the subtitle of your book, Future Proofing a Business. I, you know, I think it's all about sustainability and the the landscape of business is changing rapidly. I mean, the world is changing rapidly. And so we can't just like rest on what worked in the past. We have to be forward thinking and preparing for an unknown future. That, of course, is, you know, impossible to do completely, you know, uh, we don't, we don't know what's going to happen. So we can't completely do that. But, uh, but there are things we can do uh, that will give us a better leg up when we hit challenging times when we need to pivot. Uh, and in having good strategy chops and, and just exercising that muscle so that we can do so everyone, as you said, can do strategy on a regular kind of rolling basis, I think is just super, super important. And we all, all right. do it, so, by the way, right? So oh, whether it's yeah. in our in our per, in our personal lives, we strategize a hundred times a day. When when we think about, for example, how can we win with our um, neighborhood soccer team against um, our opponents the next time? We lay out a plan. We lay out tactics. We think about whom we put on the field. That's in its in its own right already some sort of strategizing. And we do it when we think about our next job when we apply for a new job why do we do this we do this because we care about our family and we want to provide for a family we do this when we when we pick out our home our next home that we buy we we try to yeah. figure out what's the school district to you know to be in the best catchment possible so that we can send our kids to the right school like all these questions they have a strategic component to it why don't we use it um, more for our work as well yeah, well, and I think part of it's like you just said, there's this kind of old school mentality that strategy is for the C-suite. They create the strategy and then they disseminate it on down the ranks and then everyone else just does what they tell them to. Um, that doesn't work so well anymore. Like there, there's just too much disconnect between, especially with a with a organization with lots of levels um, and, and hierarchical tiers you got to push strategy down and you have to get everyone involved in the daily strategic mindset. Um, if we hope to be relevant in the future of work. So future proofing your business fundamentally requires strategy. Like you said, it's, it's not necessarily like crazy complicated though. Like we also think, you know, there's these strategy tools, um, you know, that sometimes look pretty complicated or you have like some strategy template or someone's like, Oh, I don't know how to use that. Uh, yeah, there are tools you can use, there are frameworks you can use, but it's also fairly straightforward and it's not rocket science. So if you can just do some basic principles pretty consistently over time, you're going to be, I don't know, 80% of the way there, um, well yeah. on your way to, to yeah. being much more effective. Yeah, I totally agree. All right. Well, let's dive in and start talking about some of those key points that you think are most essential that an everyday person in the workplace, an everyday leader can really start to implement. So the first thing I would say is to understand what strategy is, to just to take the air out of this inflated mm -hmm. concept. Um, and there's no one who said it better than Roger Martin in his, in his great book, um, Playing to Win. Strategy is about making the choices that help you win in your chosen marketplace. Whatever winning means and whatever your chosen marketplace means. That mm -hmm. can be very, very different. That, that would be like... Very different for a not-for-profit organization, um, let's say in the environmental protection space, than if you take a for-profit um, software as a service company in the Silicon Valley, for example. So very, very different what, what winning means and what chosen marketplace means. But in the end, it's about deciding where do I want to invest my limited resources in? Mm -hmm. And with that, I mean, especially 
your time, your attention, because there is there are always more great ideas than you can possibly um, explore and implement. And of course, it also means um, where do I invest my funds in, right? So stretching ourselves too thin, especially when you're an entrepreneur, when you have a small business, um, can quickly lead to becoming irrelevant because you're not doing anything particularly well. So you don't stand out in a certain way. Um, when we work with um, Inc. 5000 businesses, like fast growing companies, their biggest challenge is that they have so many great ideas that they hardly uh, can focus mm -hmm. on one. There is like um, this kind of organizational ADHD happening all the time where you do one mm -hmm. thing and then the next thing and then you pivot to the next thing. And rather than focusing on a few things and doing them extraordinarily well and helping everyone in the organization understand how they contribute to these handful of priorities, that is in the end what strategy is knowing where you go and know the few priorities that will get you there and implement those with everything you have in your daily work and in the way you operate. So this is where strategy and culture start to go hand in hand. And mm -hmm. if, you're, if your organization understands that those few priorities make or break the success of the future, and if you then give everyone the, let's say, the capabilities, the skills to um, work in that direction, that is pretty powerful. And that is a concept that executive teams often understand very well um, from a, I say, from a rational perspective. The challenge starts when, when we want to implement it and help the next layer of leadership, for example, to understand it. And um, when we talk about larger organizations, when we work with Fortune 50 companies, for example, or Fortune 100, um, you, you mentioned it already, when there are multiple leadership layers already in, in place, it's really about creating that dialogue throughout the organization, up and down and, and back again, um, about strategy, about culture, and what those priorities really are. Um, you know, as well as I do, if, if, I don't, if, I, if I hire you and I don't give you anything to do within two weeks, you will have a full calendar. You, you've, you just find work. That's, what, that's how we're wired as human beings. Uh, we don't want to just sit there idling. We want to do something. So helping people to find what that priority is, what they should do and how they should do it. That's in the end what strategy is all about. What would you say are some of those key skills that top level executives need to start developing in their people, pushing down so that we can have more of that, you know, that holistic strategy mindset yeah. in what we do? Um, I think you're alluding to the to those six capabilities that I mentioned in the book. Um, of course, strategic acumen, this is kind of the no-brainer, right? When we talk about the book about strategy, strategic acumen is really a biggie. And what that simply means is, am I able to think and act strategically? That might be a bit of a no-brainer for some because, you know, yeah, I'm an executive. I need to do that. But you would be surprised how many executives we work with that grew in their, in, in their roles, in their subject matter expertise up the ranks and they never really had to strategize. They are not used to that type of mindset um, simply because they became successful in their subject matter. Um, take, take an HR person, take a salesperson. They typically grow within their field. And all of a sudden, they're meant to make decisions for an organization as a whole, not only for their area of responsibility anymore. I think this is the biggest struggle for many executives once they are the first time in, on an executive level is that it's not about your field anymore. You represent the organization. So if you have a C-suite, if you have a C-level title or an EVP title, I always struggle when I see EVP titles and they have a qualifier next to it, EVP HR or EVP marketing. That, that's not the point anymore. You're not the executive vice president for marketing. You're not representing marketing on the executive team. You represent the entire organization. So having that concept of strategic acumen early on in your career present and someone who helps you embrace it, that's a huge gift. So thinking and acting strategically is just very, very different than thinking and acting tactically and operationally. So that's yeah. number one. That's a, that's a really, really important point. I see the same thing all the time. In fact, I was having a coaching session with an executive just last week or late last week. Um, this is their first position. They're a couple of years in, so they're kind of past the 
learning curve stage or they should be right but they're still really struggling um they're struggling to to recognize the difference between the strategic and the tactical um mm. and their operational uh they they have tremendous subject matter expertise uh, that's why they were hired and promoted because they'd had exactly. a lot of previous success yet they haven't been able to transition into this approach of leading a diverse group uh, all with their own technical expertise and creating and laying out a clear vision purpose and strategy for the division and how that connects to the broader broader organizational mission and purpose yeah. um it's a super super common problem uh and you you just i think articulated well why we tend to see that over and over and over again and it's this person that i was talking with they're a good person like they're a good well-meaning person they work really hard they have good intentions yet there are a lot of problems and it's not because they're like sinister or nefarious in any way trying to think how am i going to you know mess up my division or hurt my people <laughs> of course nobody wants that um but they, but they're kind of stuck and they're drowning yeah. and they they're not sure what to do about it yeah. and so starting with the correct mindset i think is really important and for for anyone who's leading that level of executive there needs to be coaching, there needs to be mentoring, there needs to be support, especially if that's their first time in that kind of a position, because it's a yeah. hard, that's a hard transition. I'm currently working with a CFO. She is a year, almost a year into the role, her first time executive title. And um, she really struggles to let go of the things that made her successful in the past, not because she wants to hold on to these to have the same experience, but simply because she's enjoying them so much. Mm. And that is obviously a huge element in your work. Do what you enjoy, do what you love and bring your full self to work. And there is this inherent fear that if she lets go of these things, she's not going to enjoy her role so much. And, mm. and if, we, if, we, if I hear something like that, or if, if we explore something and unpack that in, in, in conversations, what we often realize is, in these moments where you enjoy something that you're not supposed to do anymore, you're robbing yourself of the opportunity to fully embrace what is your role now. And you, you need to do something like once or twice to really like it. It's like if the first time you try um, red wine, you probably didn't enjoy it too much. The second time, maybe a bit more because you start to value it and you start to explore it in all its depth and nuances. And that's the same with an executive role. Um, it can feel scary in the beginning and you will certainly miss things of your previous roles, but man, there is so much in this role that you can unpack. And if you allow yourself to do that by letting go of everything that you, that made you successful in the, in the past, that can be one of the most fulfilling roles um, that, that you can have. Yeah. It's understandable why people can be so hesitant <laughs> to let go of that though. Right. Cause that's, your whole career yeah. success up to this point has got you where you are. <laughs> and yes. it, it it seems logical in a way that I just need to keep doing what I've done up to this point. Um, and so, but, but as you so well articulated, it becomes a hindrance to your further growth and development. And it also can become a hindrance to how you lead the people that report to you. Uh, because then, you know, I see this all the time too, where an executive is like, well, I had I did XYZ to find success. And so then it becomes prescriptive and they're like, okay, so you need to do XYZ to find the same yeah. success, yeah. which just isn't how it works. And so you really do need to just be able to step back, um, reassess what is needed in your new role, refocus your time, effort, you know, and attention. And then for your people on your team who you're trying to develop your bench strength and people who can take on future roles, you know, meet them where they're at and find opportunities to develop them in a way that makes sense for their role, because it's going to be probably a bit different than the way you did it. Uh, and, the, you know, in the, in the world of coaching and mentoring, you know, far too often you see people who are super well-intentioned, but really are just trying to create little mini knees um, to mm -hmm. replicate, you know, what they did. And that yeah. just usually doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't. All right. So, so you laid out the first foundation uh, maybe run through those other five really quick. Intentionality plays a huge role. So le leading by intention. Um, there is just a finite number of minutes that we have every yeah. day that we can allocate to certain things. 
and being intentional um, to the point of being ruthless with your time. Mm -hmm. And that is something that um, executives is, is, and and not only executives, senior leaders um, really need to embrace. Um, I'm currently working with an organization that has, I've never seen an organization that has that level of overload simply because people don't respect each other's time anymore. Mm -hmm. Um, People just book each other into meetings without, people don't even know why they're in these meetings. And that creates a level of overload, like on an organization, organizational wide, you know, that is so tremendous. And so it causes so many difficulties for people because they have to decide every day, like which of those four meetings do I attend now that are in my calendar, right? So becoming ruthless with your time and 100% clear of what is it that only you can do that no one else can do. And therefore, I need to focus on it. I think this level of intention is extremely important for for, um, an organization that wants to future-proof itself. Um, And and with that, obviously, comes anything around communication, um, but also a certain level of um, being able to influence others in the best sense of the world. So helping people grow, helping people find their own way. Um, You talked about these mini-me's a minute ago. That's exactly what we don't want. We want to influence people so that they can find their their jam, their um, zone of genius, if you want. And that requires um, another one in in those six, which is about selflessness. I am not 100% sure whether selflessness is a skill, um, but I'm sure you can practice to become less self-centered so um therefore i added it to those six um and i think selflessness is something that i personally had to to learn over time um some people might you know tend toward trend toward it just from who they are as, as a being others might need to embrace it more learn it more expose themselves more to opportunities where they can consciously decide what they do And I think for many leaders, the reason why we lead is that we care about others. We do care about the future. We want to help others be successful. So that level of selflessness, um, if you infuse that into your leadership and into your thinking about strategy, that's a pretty good starting point. Yeah, I love each of those. Um, you, You mentioned one of my pet peeves, and that is when people just schedule you for a meeting and it just pops up on your calendar and there's no right or reason you don't know what the meeting's about you don't know what your connection is why you're going to it there's no agenda you're just you just know it's on your calendar oh i i really hate that so yeah let's respect people's time uh let's be strategic about how we utilize our time and how we you know tap into others people's other people's time i think that's part of being self-aware and selfless too and and how you communicate you just you, you roll all those things together you know someone who's you know more introspective and selfless and aware of others needs and is an open communicator and respects other people's time isn't going to do that (laughs) they just aren't (laughs) they're not going to just schedule those dumb meetings uh without without some sort of a reason uh behind it or justification uh and that's just one silly example like there's a whole bunch we could lay out and they all can just subtly undermine your your effectiveness as a leader and the trust that people have in you, the confidence that they have in you. Um, And, you know, as a leader, I I want to treat my people with dignity and respect. I want them to feel valued. I want them to to know that I think that what they do is important, their time is important. Uh, And so I need to to be reflective on maybe those things I'm inadvertently doing that are subtly undermining the type of culture that I'm trying to promote, or at least aspirationally, you know, I'm, I'm hoping to develop within my team. Yeah, people support um, a world that they have been part of in, in bringing to life, right? And if you, as a leader, talk about one thing and do another thing, they'd be like, what's all this talk about? It doesn't really work that way, right? We, we, in the end, we, I always say we are all animals. We look up the food chain. And if the silverback does one thing and talks about it in another way, we will still do what the silverback does because apparently that's how you become successful. And this level of self-awareness, if we have that as leaders um, and can instill that level of self-awareness into the next level of leaders and disseminate it through the organization, things start to become different because all of a sudden we're not 
we're not talking about doing things. We're walking the walk. We're walking the talk. And that is that is something really, really powerful when it comes to strategy and to strategy implementation because you stop doing things that are not in service of your culture, yeah. of your desired um, future, of your strategy. And all of a sudden, you stop wasting resources. Well, Alex... I note the time. We've only just scratched the surface, but I need to let you go here in just a minute. <laughs> Before we wrap things up for today, I just want to give you a chance to share with the audience how they can connect with you, find out more about your work, your organization, where they can find your book, and then give us a final word on the topic for today. I think the best way is, is both LinkedIn and my website. So I'm fairly active on LinkedIn. Um, it's probably easier to find me um, because of my weird German surname. It's probably easier to find my website when you go to alexthestrategist.com, all in one, um, or you dare to write my name, um, B-R-U-E-C-K-M-A-N-N.ca. That's the other alternative. Um, connect with me on LinkedIn. It's it's the best way to start a conversation with me. I'm, I'm, as I said, I'm fairly active. I always love to hear from my readers. Um and there are some really great conversations um, that start just, you know, from an area in the book that I was like, yeah, it needs to be there, but I wouldn't necessarily see it as the absolute key. But then it strikes a nerve for someone and you, all of a sudden you're in very deep conversations about it. And that's what I really love about LinkedIn, that you have these op opportunities to create these conversations. Yeah, great. Alex, thank you so much. It's just been a real pleasure. I encourage the audience to reach out, get connected, find out more about what Alex can do for you. Check out the book. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe. That you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week. Thanks for joining us for this episode of the podcast. We hope you stay healthy and safe, and please join us again soon.